Today on Ancient DOS Games, we're taking a look back at a curious old Pac-Man clone known as Memory Hog Hunter. Now, I kind of knew going into this that this is going to be a very basic game, but given the nature of it, I was hoping there'd be more history to it so that I could relay how it came to be, why it came to be, but well, trying to find information about this game's history managed to completely stump every search engine I threw it at, and even some archival tools, not helped by the game itself barely coming with any documentation at all. But with a lot of sleuthing and a little help, I think I've got a good answer now as to what's going on with this thing, and I'll go more in depth later in the video. But as for the game itself, really what you see is what you get. You have to go around collecting memory chips and then collect the super memory chips to be able to catch the memory hogs, and when all the chips are collected, the level resets and the rate the hogs can spawn at is increased. There is literally nothing more to the gameplay itself. I mean, apart from the fact that the hogs can eat the regular memory chips too and thus you won't get the points for them, but since there's not really an end to the game, that's kind of inconsequential. Also you get an extra life at 20,000 points, if you manage to play the game for that long, as you typically only get about 2,000 points per level. I should also note too that this game uses a very old graphics rendering API called the Halo Resident Language Interface, developed by Media Cybernetics in the 80s, which is one of those unicorns of of DOS software development, as surprisingly few things seem to have been made with it, and there's no information about this thing online anywhere, not even from media cybernetics themselves, which still seem to be around all these years later. In fact, the only other game I was able to find which uses the same API was the strategic simulations title B24, released for DOS the same year as this game, 1988. <laughs> Memory Hog Hunter was originally developed by Jim Badillo and published by Intel in 1988, and is effectively a one-player arcade-style game. It only supports EGA 640x350 16-color graphics and PC speaker sound, and as for its current release date, given that the game was given away for free with promotional material for the Intel Above board, it's safe to say this thing was and always has been freeware, though good luck finding it online anywhere. At the time of my making this video, the only place I know of which has a copy readily available for download is the DOS Games website at www.dosgames.com. Yep, super simple game stats for a super simple game. You know, I was considering maybe skipping on the gameplay section of the video since pretty much every ADG video up to now has had a gameplay section and it'd be kind of fun to make one without a gameplay section, but nah, I should probably explain things at least a little better than just saying the game is as simple as it looks. The goal of the game is simply to amass as many points as you can by collecting RAM chips and preventing the memory hogs from doing the same. Now, normally touching one of the memory hogs causes you to lose a life, but if you're supercharged, then touching a memory hog will instead not only defeat said hog, but will collect the software package that hog happened to represent, with the software packages represented here being notorious memory hogs themselves back in the day, each of which is shown on the side of the screen as a small pixel art rendition of its box. One of the tricks, though, is that when you spawn into a level, you start very close to the first hog to also spawn in, so you have to start moving right away or you're liable to die within a split second. Uh, granted, once you get away from that first hog, you're going to notice pretty quickly that the AI is... um dumb. In fact, the way the AI seems to work is to just randomly change direction anytime it reaches an intersection, which in turn causes them to mostly just end up stuck in the middle of the arena given the way it happens to be laid out, though they can and will get loose into the rest of the arena if you let them. Now, even though there's no numerical level indicated for how deep you are into the game, every time you clear a level and move on to the next, the time between spawns for the hogs gets shorter, ultimately down to a fairly short period where they spawn just a few seconds apart from each other, and up to a maximum of four at a time. Though when you first start the game, you're going to notice their spawn time is exceptionally long, almost too long really, though perhaps some of this is down to the kinds of computers being used to play the game. I was trying my best to get the speed to be appropriate for a typical 8 megahertz computer system of the time, and I think I got it right, but it still seems a bit too slow in some moments, but then if I make it any faster, it feels a bit too fast in terms of the audio. So I just sort of had to find a happy medium. And yeah, there's really not much more to this thing, and although I suppose I can point out that the hogs are not able to collect the super RAM chips, only the regular chips, and yes, if it's a hog which collects the last RAM chip instead of you, the level advances and resets as intended. 
I mean, I kind of wish this game had more to it, like randomly generated mazes, different kinds of hogs, or heck, even a high score table might have been nice. But knowing what I know now, I kind of understand why only a small amount of effort was put into this, rather than trying to turn it into a full-fledged gaming product. Okay, so I had no idea going into this that information about this game and anything related to it was going to be incredibly scarce, full of inconsistencies, and often contradictory, not helped by there being a massive number of revisions of the Intel Above board which was being promoted by this thing, none of which are specifically referenced here, given that the original Intel Above board debuted in 1984, a full year prior to the adoption of the 3.2 expanded memory specifications, and four years before XMS was a thing on DOS PCs. Actually, yeah, I'd better explain what's going on here a bit better. See, this was basically a game made to help promote a range of expansion cards built for personal computers, each called the Intel Above Board. And these were essentially a whole series of early memory expansion cards designed to get around that pesky 640 kilobyte conventional memory limit, which a certain someone originally tried to convince the world should be enough for anybody, who later went on to say that the expanded memory specifications they came up with were garbage, but they were going to do it anyways since they needed a solution as soon as possible and the way better XMS specifications they'd cooked up for the Xenix operating system didn't end up being ready for DOS until 1988. I mean, sure, at a personal level and until stuff started getting more complex, 640k was enough, but businesses routinely butted up against RAM limits given the amount of data they were pushing through their computer systems, and they needed something. Thus, EMS was born. So yeah, have you ever wondered why EMS and XMS were both a thing? There you go. EMS was sort of the stopgap measure for businesses using MS-DOS as their operating system, despite Microsoft trying to push businesses to run Xenix instead, which was a relatively popular Unix variant. EMS relied on bank switching and was thus highly inelegant and slow, but it worked. Whereas XMS, which was already a thing on Xenix, took a little more time to get standardized for DOS, but once it was ready, it was generally far better to work with. However, EMS continued to be a thing for quite some time because you could add EMS to just about any system through expansion cards, whereas XMS was only possible on 8286 systems and beyond because it relied on the presence of protected mode. And back then, just like nowadays, businesses are generally very resistant to update computer hardware that's already working perfectly fine. But all of that said, the question still remains. Why does this game even exist? Or when did it even come out? Like, there's no copyright details anywhere in this thing, and the file dates on the copy I came across are all wrong. And plus, if we go by the supposed release year of 1988, well, that's roughly four years after the original Intel Above Board debuted, and again, right around the time XMS was hitting DOS systems. Now, heck, some revisions of the Above Board are even capable of mapping to XMS instead of EMS, if the target operating system and hardware can support it. However, there's one neat little thing we can go by here. Now, earlier, I mentioned that during the gameplay, when you stop one of the hogs, you get a software package which shows up at the side. Well, I looked into all of the box art here, as some of them are recreations from highly recognizable packages, such as Lotus 123, Windows 286, and WordPerfect. Well, the box used for Lotus 123 is from 1988, the box used for Windows 286 is from the very end of 1987, and the particular box art here for WordPerfect is specifically for version 5.0, not the more popular 5.1, which, you guessed it, is from 1988. Well, I mean, this box art was also used for the Atari ST release of WordPerfect in 1987, but I've got a funny feeling that's not the version we're referencing here. So that answers the when. This game was clearly written in 1988. But why? Well, I couldn't find a good answer to that question. So I went straight to the source. It turns out this game's author, Jim Badillo, is still very much around, as he's one of two partners who run a business consulting firm nowadays called BRI Consulting. I managed to get in touch with him and found out that this game was part of Intel's push to get businesses to upgrade their equipment and buy more hardware in the late 80s, which they called their Personal Computer Enhancement Operation, which Jim was a part of as a summer intern. 
Now, one of his tasks was to put together a fun little game, which would be part of an information package sent to clients who were looking to upgrade their Intel-driven hardware, thus, here we are. The purpose of the game wasn't so much to advertise Intel's above-board products, but rather instead just to keep the Intel and above-board names in people's minds, so that once they were done perusing the promotional material they specifically asked for, they wouldn't just immediately forget about it and would thus be more likely to make a purchase. The game didn't need to be good, it just needed to be something to catch and keep the attention of people already looking to do upgrades, so that they'd remember to do so. Or not end up going with a competitor's products, because yeah, memory expansion cards were not just the domain of Intel. All of the major computer hardware manufacturers were trying to get in on that back then, given that there was a ton of money to be had in RAM. So yeah, this turned out to be about what I expected. Overall, Memory Hog Hunter is just a basic game designed to be distributed with promotional material. As a standalone thing, it doesn't quite stand alone. In fact, it kind of falls over due to its lack of difficulty and lack of variety. But again, that was never the point of it. It was just supposed to help cement sales. And whether it actually did help businesses pull the trigger on purchasing expensive memory upgrades or not, we may never know. One thing's for sure though, it's fairly neat that this managed to surface again all these years later. Well, heck, I've been told there might even be more promotional Intel games lost to time, but who knows how long it's going to be, if ever, before any working copies show up again. I found the best cycles count for running this game in DOSBox to be about 1000 cycles. Auto and Max run it too fast, anything over 1000 messes with the sound effects, and anything below 1000 is way too slow. Other than that, it should run without issue, though the graphics API it uses is handled through a TSR program, and while there is a batch file included which will load the TSR automatically, if you try to run the game without that TSR loaded, it'll simply refuse to run with no error messages or anything, so just keep that in mind when you're trying to get it working. Anywho, that'll be all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Next up, two Saturdays from now, on October 1st, will be a filler video, and there's a particular Doom Engine game I used to play in the 2000s, which I haven't touched in a very long time now, which I think will be fun to take another look at, given that, as far as I'm aware, the thing's come a very long way since I originally played it. And just to get your intrigue spiking that much higher, it's technically a fan game. Yeah, better be sure to stay tuned to see what kind of game this could possibly even be. Thanks for watching, everyone, and extra special thanks to everyone supporting me on Patreon. If you'd like to join the ranks of everyone you see here supporting the show directly, head on over to patreon.com slash K-A-S-I-C-K.